I've never thought much about my nose, at least not until I started making YouTube videos and seeing comments about it. And even then, all the comments I've seen have been lovely ones, so as a consequence, I hardly ever think about my nose. I recognize that, among women, nose insecurity is something that is pretty widespread and that I, as is usual on this channel, am in the minority once again. I honestly didn't think much about noses. But then I went looking and I saw the clear distress, the heartache and agony of being forced by nature to wear a particularly protruding bit of tissue in the center of that place where snap judgments are made, potential partners attracted or avoided, and personality expressed. Going into this video, I want to keep some facts in mind. The country with the highest rate of cosmetic node surgery in the world is, you guessed it, it's Iran. According to the Iranian newspaper Etamad, 200 thousand Iranians per year go under the knife in order to, and I quote, reduce the size of their nose and make the tip point upwards. Basically, the Rhinology Research Society of Iran, in collaboration with Johns Hopkins University, established that the rate of nose jobs per capita in Iran is seven times that of the United States. The first nose job, or rather nose reconstruction surgery, was performed in 700 BC by the ancient Indian physician and first known surgeon Shoshruta. He developed an innovative way for those who had lost their noses as a form of criminal punishment to have a nose reconstructed after the fact. This was known as the forehead flap method and it was used continually until the 16th century. The outbreak of syphilis which swept Europe in the 15th century left many with rather grotesque facial deformities. And one of the most notable of these deformities was known as the syphilis nose, which developed in three stages. And it wasn't just that having syphilis resulted in many a facial and bodily trauma, it was also associated inevitably with severe social stigma. The forehead flap method, or also known as the Indian method, was still used in the 15th century. However, it was soon surpassed by the Italian method. And this method method was more appealing because unlike the Indian method, it didn't leave the same level of overt scarring, which made it known to people that somebody had inevitably gotten themselves a new nose. The Italian method was developed by surgeon Gaspara Tagliacozzi, and the way that this method prevented scarring was ultimately by using skin from the upper arm of a patient, putting it on the face and making an entirely new nose nose from it. And this Italian method was all well and good. For a fortnight, a patient would have to keep their arm strapped to their face in order to prevent the new nose from falling off. And after that, well, they would have a new nose, at least until winter came. And with winter came noses suddenly turning a very vibrant Russian velvet and dropping off overnight. And in this sense, the Italian method soon died out. And once again, the Indian method was all the vogue. Now let's fast forward to the 19th century, specifically the last decade of the 19th century. And now we take our story specifically to Germany. For the first time in history, reconstructive facial surgery is performed not in order to replace tissue that had been lost from from trauma or disease, but instead surgery is performed on that which is already there, that which is operated on for aesthetic reasons primarily. The remarkable possibility of aesthetic surgery is conceptualized by German Jewish doctor Jacques Joseph. I'd like to dedicate a full section to this intriguing individual who ultimately began it all insofar as associating cosmetic surgery with one's ability to psychologically deal with society society. Now, a great deal of this video is going to be about anti-Semitism and the painstaking attempts that European Jewry have attempted to assimilate. And cosmetic surgery has a great deal to do with this. Meet Jacques Joseph, a German Jewish general practitioner who had a particular belief in his own abilities and medical genius. He began working in the late 1890s alongside 
Clyde, who was then known as Germany's most renowned orthopedic surgeon and pioneer, Dr. Julius Wolff. Now, one day in 1896, Joseph was visited by two parents who were in absolute and utter distress. Their 10-year-old son had outright refused to ever go back to school and things were becoming quite serious. And the reason for him refusing to go to school was because of the severe bullying he was experiencing every day as soon as he got to school for, well, his donkey's ears. A risk taker and thoughtful man, Joseph devised a form of reductive surgery and he spent months deliberating over this procedure, the risks and the benefits, and ultimately went along with it without the approval of his mentor, mind you. And it was actually a success. The boy went back to school, his parents could hardly get him out of school after that, and Joseph took his findings to the Berlin Medical Society, who were very impressed and very surprised. Julius Wolff was also surprised, but not necessarily impressed, due to the substantial risk that Joseph had taken. His main concern was that there wasn't anything medically wrong with this 10-year-old boy. And as a consequence, Joseph was forced to abandon his studies in orthopedic surgery. He was forced to leave his mental and had to go back to being a general practitioner. Now I'd like to take you across the pond, away from Europe, particularly from the prevalence of Prussian mores and Christian dogmatism to the United States, where a very different medical culture dominated. The story of no surgery in the United States in the 1880s is a very interesting and different one. Although this this difference had some important similarities, which we will get into. By 1887, New York-based otolaryngologist John Orlando Rowe had performed the world's first rhinoplasty in a way that surpassed anything preceding it. Unlike the Indian method, Rowe's method was performed inside the nose, meaning that no scarring was left after the fact, and therefore this retained the secrecy of a procedure. Rose rhinoplasty was conceptualized as a solution to the so-called pug nose. That is what among immigrants to the United States was considered to be a servile Irish physiognomy, deducing analogies to dogs. To be Irish was to be deemed poor, as from the mid-19th century, Irish immigrants were forced to undertake the most low-paid, menial and dangerous jobs. And having a pug nose immediately either identified you as Irish or in most cases reinforced the myth that by having a pug nose, you were therefore Irish. Now, only very recently is scholarship and academia beginning to take seriously how mainstream and widespread Irish discrimination was in the United States. And this is largely due, thankfully, to a 14-year-old girl who was willing to question an academic who was quite certain that Irish discrimination, or more accurately, Irish-American discrimination, was really not that big a deal. Irish Americans faced blatant discrimination, which revolved around identifiable facial features, such as the alleged stereotypical pug nose. And this was seen as evolutionarily based evidence that Irish Catholics were not as fully evolved whites as American Protestants. Irish Catholics were deemed to be on par or nigh equivalent to African Americans in terms of eugenicist arguments. Measured against the standard of the English nose in Britain or the German nose in America, the Irish nose was too short. The Irish nose and the Jewish nose and the African nose were all alike in that they represented difference. Rowe's procedure therefore offered Irish Americans a loophole when it came to finding work and assimilating into American society. And importantly, the secret secrecy of the procedure meant that individuals could assimilate without then having to convert as well, which
which was often a prerequisite of assimilating into a society. And considering that Roe's procedure was all very new, it meant that Irish Americans could go to him and would get the procedure without having to pay anything. And what is noticeable is that Roe's technique and method made its way to Germany, where it had a substantial impact on Joseph's and, importantly, his German Jewish clientele. So, from the late 1890s, Joseph had been developing a theory around aesthetic surgery, like the surgery that he had performed on the 10-year-old boy's ears. And this was because in 1898, Joseph was visited by a man who had heard about his successful surgery on the young boy. And on hearing this, he posited to Joseph that he could perform the same surgery, not on his ears, but on on what he called his embarrassingly large nose. And because this is Joseph, who is an idealist and is a risk taker, he obliged and formulated a procedure similar to that that he had performed on the boy's ears, namely reductive surgery. And like the ear reduction surgery, the nose reduction surgery was just as successful. And Joseph took his findings back to the Berlin Medical Center society, except this time he had a theoretical framework to propose to them. A person whose looks caused social or economic disadvantage was just as severely afflicted as a person who suffered from a debilitating disease. You see, although reports don't put it in so many words, it is very likely that the man who Joseph operated on was either Jewish or was deemed by society and the society around him to be Jewish because of the prevalence of the stereotypes surrounding the so-called Jewish hooked nose. Anti-Semitic tropes and negative stereotypes regarding Jewish appearances in Europe were mainstream and to this day remain prevalent. The success of assimilation into European culture and society was largely based on how non-Jewish one looked, that is how successfully one passed past as European. Consider, for instance, Helmut Wilberg, a Luftwaffe Air Force general in Nazi Germany. He was Jewish, but because of his appearances, he successfully passed as Aryan. And he passed so successfully to the extent that when it was eventually discovered that his mother was Jewish, Hermann Göring personally had him reclassified as Aryan because, well, it just could not be. All the way back at the turn of the 20th century, Joseph's recognized the psychological effects as well as the social and economic disadvantages German Jews were placed at as a consequence of being identified as Jewish on the basis of their looks. And this would include Germans who, due to their large noses, were deemed to be Jewish. Therefore, some of Joseph's first aesthetic procedures were in direct response to this seeming defect of Jewish nostrility. And he and many of his clients saw it as a solution, the lesser of two evils, insofar as permitting Jews an alternative way of assimilating, so that essentially the psychological trauma and torment of anti-Semitism on their everyday lives could be reduced, eliminated entirely in many a case. Because what Joseph recognized as early as the 1900s was that anti-Semitism wasn't going anywhere. Society wasn't going to change and therefore it was for minorities such as Jews to make their existence and their lives as bearable and survivable as possible. Through aesthetic surgery, one now had the option to change oneself, but more importantly to change oneself convincingly and secretly. There was no need to convert. There was no obligation to convert insofar as therefore being able to assimilate. One could assimilate just by altering their nose. In his book, Making the Body Beautiful, Sanders L. Gilman writes that minority
minorities in the 20th century depended on aesthetic surgery in order to advance themselves socio-politically but also mentally. Aesthetic surgery helped minorities approximate the ideals established by whatever tribe was in power at the time, thus supporting Joseph's theory that aesthetic surgery served a profound psychological and social function. In 1960s Saigon, plastic surgery was immensely popular during the Vietnam War. It enabled Vietnamese women in South Vietnam to appear and make themselves look more Western. With the build-up of foreign troops from 1965, Vietnamese bar girls reported to army doctors that American GIs, and I quote, preferred them with rounded eyes and big breasts and hips. It became part of their livelihood. It helped them get jobs and American husbands. The American presence in Vietnam created a trend for rounded eyes, curved noses, contours, and a Western profile. The gradual fashion change from the traditional Vietnamese Ao Dai tunic to Western dress has reinforced the vogue. In their eagerness to emulate Europeans, some Vietnamese want bigger noses, dimpled cheeks, a cleft chin, bigger breasts, hips and thighs, and even fatter fingers. Cosmetic surgery has become a thriving industry that is literally changing the face of Vietnam. Vietnamese women and Vietnamese men desired their naturally flat bridge on their nose to be pumped full of silicon in order to look more Western, in order to look like what in the 60s was now all the vogue in terms of rhinoplasties, ironically the Irish pug nose. In 1973, Dr. Vuban, a army doctor turned cosmetic surgeon in South Vietnam, described his work as being able to transform what he called and I quote, natural Asian defects in a matter of hours, a nose job in less than an hour. South Vietnam's most famous film star, Tam Tao Hong, reportedly had every procedure popular during the 60s and 70s, essentially becoming a completely different woman. Like Jacques Joseph, Dr. Vu Bang considers aesthetic surgery in much the same theoretical framework. Plastic surgery is more than superficial beauty. By removing a woman's complexes, we give her confidence and transform her psychology. It's a lot of fun, and it's an art form in itself. We are in the age of black beauty, but seemingly only insofar as it is not on a black body. Because when big lips, hips and tits are on a black body, you inevitably get everything else that comes with being black. If you look at Kim Kardashian or Kylie Jenner, you can instantly see what is bodily speaking in and what isn't. Black hips, lips and tits are a go, but what is dubbed the wide, broad African nose nose is and has always been out. The shape of your nose is largely influenced by climate and its evolutionary impact on random genetic drift. In short, the colder the climate, the narrower the nose would be. And this was not just because of evolution, but also human influence. In cold climates, humans with narrower noses were at an advantage in terms of survival. Their nostrils could alter airflow and more efficiently warm incoming air via the nasal membrane. Insane in the membrane. <laughs> Sorry. And because narrow-nosed individuals were at an advantage, they were more likely to survive and, as a consequence, were more likely to reproduce. And this therefore caused their genes to not only pass down to the next generation, but to also strengthen. And as such, their numbers dominate. Desirability is largely fixated around these tenets. And alternatively, wider, flatter noses are more common in hot climates. Yet, as I said, social influence is contributing more and more so to noses and their shapes. Cultural preferences for a particular nose shape will mean that individuals with genes which correspond to the preference are more likely to breed successfully, namely in terms of looks and the social advantages which come with having those looks and preferred physical qualities. They will then spread their genes to the next generation, as well as the 
the societal advantages which come along with them, but they are also likely to influence what is considered the dominant cultural preference and aesthetic desirability within the wider society. On YouTube, black beauty creators are often ridiculed for what is called contouring their noses. The amount of terminology within the beauty community is unreal and, for me at least, unfathomable. <laughs> the nose-slimming technique has been tried, tested and altered in order to make one's nose appear slimmer, smaller and more refined to the face. And the ridicule comes from the idea that contouring is in effect creating an illusion. An illusion which fits into and abides to so-called Western standards of beauty, namely in Western cultures where the climate is colder, evolutionary speaking, as I said, the narrow nose is the preference and the smaller nose. What I gather from watching these YouTubers is that when it comes to the sphere of beauty, what is considered attractive is a smaller nose because it is considered to be more feminine, more dainty looking. What I also gather is that stereotypically the black nose, which is wider and flatter, is considered to be more masculine. And such stereotypes are not beyond the minds of academics at all. One of London's finest evolutionary psychologists, Dr. Satoshi Kanazawa, published a blog post turned published article in Psychology Now or Psychology Today in 2011 titled why are black women less physically attractive than other women? He concluded his findings as objective, even though they were based on less than credible and definitive data sets. His conclusions and arguments were so steeped in his own socially influenced biases that it isn't worth taking terribly seriously. But stereotypes are taken seriously, whether we want to admit it or not, so it is important to consider. However, his assertions that and I quote, black woman scored lower, Asian highest, was because according to him, and I quote again, African women have higher levels of testosterone than other races and therefore have more masculine features. An example of such masculine features is, at least in Western societies, the black nose. Now, in my personal opinion, the black nose finds itself in a bit of a predicament, especially online. And when I say the black nose, Remember, I'm talking about the stereotype of the black nose as masculine. Firstly, black noses differ across time and space. If you go to North Africa, you'll see a completely different nose to the ones you see in West Africa, Southern Africa, East Africa, among the African diaspora, among African Americans. So it is obviously a lot more complex than merely the black nose. However, the negative stereotype still stands. And this stereotype is often applied simply because somebody is black. I have never considered myself to have a big nose or even a flat nose. However, I now consider myself to have one based on the extensive personal analyses I've been doing of my nose of... <laughs> present. All rhinoplasties and nose procedures are only successful insofar as the new nose fits the face. Basically, the procedure and technique has to fit the face and not the other way around. It must essentially bring everything together and appreciate the entirety of a face. But when in the case of modern beauty standards, particular features are picked, breasts, hips, butts, lips, without Without real consideration to how they are largely given their noteworthy beauty and significance by being considered in relation to the face and the body of the person as an entirety, as a fully and whole bodied individual, it becomes essentially impossible for those who have desirable bits but not a desirable whole to fit into any kind of prominent beauty standard. The black body therefore cannot win when it comes to meeting beauty standards. Essentially, even with successful surgery, a black person is not going to fit the beauty standard by mere fact of their desirable bits.
it's not equating to a desirable whole. In contrast, a Kardashian or Jenner have the desirable whole in their arsenal, racially and socially speaking, and they can therefore afford at whim to add or subtract desirable bits at their leisure. Consider, for instance, Kim Kardashian's alleged, alleged BBL, followed by what was then, at least post-pandemic, the reverse procedure on this surgery. Cosmetic surgeons and specialists with regards to talking about their black clientele are saying increasingly that this clientele is more interested in retaining their ethnic features and not merely just getting a carbon copy of the European nose. Essentially, their objective is to look more feminine according to the particular traits and preferences within their own ethnic group. The emphasis about Above all else is on making the nose appear smaller as opposed to diminishing its ethnic traits or taking away from any ethnic features on the face. Plastic surgeons are primarily exposed to and train on Caucasian patients, meaning that the different variations in ethnic features are not properly explored and understood from the get-go. For instance, black skin, particularly around the nose, is a lot thicker than Caucasian skin. Nasal bones are short and flat. Cartilage is short, floppy and weak, which is why piercings are easier, heal faster and aren't as commonly rejected by the body. Dr. Jennifer Parker Porter, MD, says there's a lot of differences between black and Caucasian noses when we think about what's under the skin. Some people have very short bones. These can be difficult to maneuver in the operating room as they are harder to manipulate. Whereas long bones are great because you can break them and move them exactly where you want. Oftentimes, doctors think the solution for a nose job on a black person is to pinch it in, in order to get that defined tip appearance. But it ends up looking awkward, unnatural, and completely skews the face. There are other ways you can get the definition without having that disproportionate artificial look. So, if any of you are considering getting a rhinoplasty or any kind of of nose job, I would wholeheartedly take Dr. Jennifer Parker Porter's advice. Look for a surgeon who not only has experience working on the noses and faces of people from your ethnic group, but importantly, has evidence of success, namely from their clientele satisfaction post-surgery. Botched nose jobs among ethnic clientele is disproportionately high, and this is largely because plastic surgeons in the West have not been exposed to a diverse ethnic clientele. A surgeon should want to celebrate and appreciate your particular ethnic aesthetic, as well as your personal attributes. The aim should not be to diminish or to reconstruct in as much as it should be to accentuate what is already there. A pinched nose has never characteristically been an African-American trait, for example, and it therefore looks noticeably artificial and unnatural. So basically, the nose must fit the face. So as we've established, there is an inherent anti-Semitism in the idea of big noses in the context of modern societies. Many people still believe that a large hooked nose is just a physical feature of Jewish people. It is an image so deeply embedded in modern culture that most do not acknowledge that it is actually a deeply anti-Semitic stereotype writes Jeremy Ullman. This was a phenomenon which emerged after the 12th century, but it gained a widespread audience under Nazi propaganda from the 1930s onwards. This is perhaps the first instance of how a physical standard of social acceptability went mainstream. Under the Reich Ministry of Public Enlightenment and Propaganda, visuals were everything, especially when it came to the spread of ideas across time and space. Cinema was the most effective and contemporary medium in doing this. The pseudo-scientific documentary The Eternal Jew and the feature-length film Zeus the Jew are perhaps the most overtly anti-Semitic productions ever made, both of which relied substantially on the hooked nose trope. The latter film was seen by over 20 million people and it is an anti-Semitic take on the life, the trial and anti-Semitic motivated 
execution of Jewish courtier and financier, German Jewish rather, Joseph Oppenheimer or Joseph Zeus Oppenheimer, hence Zeus the Jew. And the entertainment industry across the Western world is still heavily under this influence. In 1948, the Hollywood adaptation of Charles Dickens' Oliver Twist caused some controversy, mainly because of, well, its depiction of Fagin as the way Charles Dickens had initially intended it. Fagin is a swindling, money-hungry Jewish underground kinsman. Fagin has been portrayed as a stereotypically large-nosed Jewish man ever since productions and adaptations started to be made. Ben Kingsley portrayed Fagin in the 2005 adaptation. Kingsley also had a role in one of my all-time favourite films, Tuck Everlasting, produced in 2002. And in this film, his character fulfills all the negative stereotypes associated with the anti-Semitic reckoning of Jewishness. His character, the man in the yellow jacket, is not only shown to be money-hungry, aging, malicious and conniving, but he is also characteristically Jewish in the way of having a large nose, long hair and ultimately wandering in search of fortune, which ultimately fulfills the stereotype of the wandering Jew. Consider something as subtle and subconscious as the depiction of goblins as greedy little bankers in Harry Potter. They have hooked noses, are exclusionary, are greedy, are money hungry, caring only about protecting gold at all costs. And in all of this, whether consciously or subconsciously, the nose is the defining feature. So it is understandable why so many celebrities of either Jewish descent or who are deemed to be Jewish based on their facial features have opted for, at least during the 20th century, to undergo cosmetic procedures, more specifically the rhinoplasty. And this wasn't just because of body image issues, but also for practical reasons, in order to land work. And this is understandable in an industry where in order to land work, assimilation physically is vital. A particular beauty standard is not only upheld, but is upheld as being the one and only. And in looking at specific examples of Jewish actors, it is clear that this trope and this negative stereotype of beauty, particularly with regards to the nose, has had quite a substantial impact. Because even to this day, having a hooked nose comes with numerous a challenge. And it is clearly a very perplexing and frustrating challenge, largely because the Jewish nose is a complete and utter myth. Yet it is, on the other hand, a very powerful one. There is no such thing as the Jewish nose. Having a large or big nose is not attributed to any specific group, ethnic group, religious group, what have you. Take Leah Michelle and her glee nemesis Diana Agron. Rachel Berry was ridiculed for her large nose, as is Leah Michelle online, which is deemed to be a stark identifier of her Jewishness. Are you suggesting that I get a nose job? You're 16, right? That's when I gave my daughters theirs. It's like a rite of passage for Jewish girls. I like how I look. Is she your girlfriend? No. What does your girlfriend look like? Diana, who plays Quinn Fabre, is the epitome of the stereotypical American girl next door beauty. However, she is also Jewish. And their different noses? Well, as I said with regards to climate and evolutionary biology, it makes sense when looking at where their ancestors descended from. Michelle descends from Greek Sephardic Jews hot climate. Agron descends from Ashkenazi Russian Jews, cold climate, narrow, smaller nose. Classic Jewish features are an amalgamation of stereotypes and exaggerations used by anti-Semites and anti-Semitic agendas. And it is a very good example of how stereotypes, both positive and negative, hold great power and sway over a wider society, irrespective of whether we 
want to consciously admit it or not. And it is also clear, based on individuals' responses to them, how oftentimes they are burdened with having to alter themselves in order to distance themselves from the stereotype or take advantage of it if, well, they have the means in their arsenal. Sometimes we have no choice but to accept the stereotypes bestowed on us by the wider world, especially if we want to get on with our lives as smoothly and conflict-free as possible. The actress Jennifer Grey is an example in point. Her father, Joel Grey, and her mother, Joe Wielder, both had nose surgery, namely rhinoplasties, early on in their acting careers. In her memoir, Out of the Corner, Jennifer writes, I cannot help but notice that the roles my dad was being cast in were decidedly not Jewish. The part he became most identified with, the master of ceremonies in cabaret, was most likely a Nazi or Nazi adjacent. In Dirty Dancing, Jennifer plays Baby Hausman, an unapologetic Jewish middle-class girl who is ready to join the Peace Corps. Everybody loves Dirty Dancing, and based on my reading online at least, so especially do many Jews because it breaks all stereotypes. The Jewish girl with the big nose gets the incredibly good-looking working-class Irish American Catholic. And importantly, he loves her for her. She is not the stereotype when it comes to beauty, but my god, by the end of the film, do we know that she is on fire. Absolutely beautiful. Yet after her incredible success in Dirty Dancing, Jennifer found it nigh impossible to land any roles. And her mother's verdict was a sad but all too true one. It's much harder to photograph you than a Michelle Pfeiffer. You want a career, make it easier for them. While Jennifer went under the knife to such an extent as to be unrecognizable post-op, Barbara Streisand was making a name for herself and her unapologetically Jewish nose. Barbara was essentially baby in real life, but let's substitute dancing for singing. And there are some celebrities like Barbara. However, also like Barbara, the majority of their career and success in their career is not dependent on their looks alone. I think we can all agree that the vast majority of Hollywood, in which it includes millions of actors and actresses, is largely looks dependent over anything else. Hollywood rewards them financially and in terms of publicity. However, in terms of the public memory of such individuals across time and space, particularly after their demise, we only remember a handful. And it oftentimes isn't because of their looks. We remember them for their personhood, for everything that they are, irrespective of looks alone. Barbara Streisand has been ridiculed for her looks since the 60s. Meryl Streep was denied roles on numerous occasions because of her looks, notably her nose and a refusal to get it fixed. We knew it was coming. We knew a mention of Meryl Streep was coming somewhere, but it actually makes a lot of sense. Meryl Streep was a contender for both Evita and King Kong. However, I mean, that hefty nose. But of no fault of their own, these trailblazers in unconventionally attractive celebrities, from Barbara Streisand to Meryl Streep, from Adrian Brody to Adam Driver, have not changed things for big-nosed people or celebrities. That is too much of a responsibility to place on any one celebrity or individual. As journalist Hadley Friedman wrote so succinctly in an article recently in the Jewish Chronicle, only Jewish women who don't have classic Jewish features are seen as desirable, Natalie Portman say, or Scarlett Johansson. Barbara Streisand is a rule unto herself, and I love her for casting herself opposite an array of blonde men 
men, from Robert Redford to Nick Nolte. But she didn't change things for Jewish women, she just changed things for Streisand. If your talent is so indispensable and so unique that it exceeds your looks and is not looks dependent, things can largely work in your favour, as is the example with Meryl Streep, who in her 70s is still landing roles. And importantly, not just the roles of the stereotypical old granny who needs to feature as a counterpart to a family dynamic. Her talent is such that roles are essentially being made and written for her as Meryl Streep in her 60s and 70s. Now that's talent. Before ending this video, I would like to talk about men and their noses. Because men are a much neglected group when it comes to talking about rhinoplasties and cosmetic surgery in general, especially considering that 25% of nose jobs conducted in the United States per year are done on men. And it is the most popular cosmetic surgery among men. And it is a surgery that increases by 3% each Year. Therefore, not only are men under the knife, but they are increasingly, willingly going under the knife. When asked, it tends to revolve around men wanting to appear more competitive in the workplace. If we go all the way back to Jacques Joseph's patient who came to him with his embarrassingly large nose, this makes sense. He couldn't face even going out into the world of work, looking as he perceived himself to look, or correction as others perceived him to look. This man found himself lacking in self-confidence to the extent that it was a stalemate on his entire life and sociability. Cosmetic surgery has permitted men to garner a new sense of self-confidence. A more balanced and symmetrical face is deemed a more trustworthy face insofar as being the more desirable facial structure evolutionarily speaking. And in the workplace, trust is everything. The American Society of Plastic Surgeons writes, Our society places a high value on looking young and fit. Today, men of all ages and all walks of life are requesting plastic surgery for cosmetic reasons. Men's goals may include a more balanced nose, rejuvenated face, and a trimmer waistline. But men don't speak as openly about their procedures or about wanting to get such procedures. And as with stereotypes, I think that this has a lot to do with the wider society not willingly or at least openly willingly accepting that men have physical insecurities on the same emotive and vulnerable level as women. And yes, this has a lot to do with pride, but I think it has equally a lot to do with our social disdain for men expressing emotion and vulnerability in such a way. And the contradiction in this, like with plastic surgery in an attempt to assimilate, is that it doesn't get to the root of the problem. However, in terms of boosting one's own confidence, it is proving quite exceptional and effective. And clearly, men are just as susceptible to the pressures of mainstream society and culture as women. Oh, at least we can agree on something. I must say that I am neither for nor against plastic surgery because clearly everybody is on their own journey in the sense of how they perceive their self. And inevitably, I as an individual cannot tell somebody that their journey, particularly in relation to specific social factors, specific stereotypes which impact how they feel, how they are perceived by others, is right or not to get a particular procedure done. Life is incredibly hard for everybody in different ways and to different extents and at different points in time. How people deal with that is truly fascinating and important to understand and to try and sympathize with. There is, however, some deep-seated recognition within human beings that our face in its entirety conveys a lot more than merely meat and tissue. Basically, our physical features are more than just meat and tissue 
coming together on a face or body. If some of us find the prospect of plastic surgery unsettling, that is largely owing to some deep-seated suspicion borne out by observation that appearances aren't purely arbitrary. They contain important information and by altering those appearances, we falsify that information. And I do somewhat agree with this sentence and it is probably the one thing which makes me fearful of plastic surgery insofar as achieving its objectives to the extent proposed by the likes of Joseph. As a modern society, we have not sufficiently seen the effects of plastic surgery on the psyche over time, particularly in old age. A very topical discussion which I'm seeing more of is this idea of how we age, whether we try to defy the aging process via cosmetic procedures or whether we age naturally or as we like to call it online gracefully. And of course this is difficult. The vast majority of us are not going to age like Angela Bassett. In the 80s it was the John Hughes approved button nose. The it noses, at least according to plastic surgeons now, are those of Angelina Jolie and Kim Kardashian. Yet noticeably, at least reading different forums and different websites promoting particular clinics and centers, patients are increasingly becoming prouder and more accepting of their ethnic personalities. And this represents a new and I would say improved trend. But is that just what it is? A trend? Will the new obsession be with a particular K-pop star's nose? Or that of the Korean nose in general? Or with something cute and dainty like Bella Porsche's Filipino-American nose? Who knows? But when anything is described as trendy, I cringe. What I do know is that conflating plastic surgery with trends and trend setting has made its way onto forums and to social media platforms such as TikTok, where a very young and impressionable audience of children and teens are seeing and being influenced by them. And they are the more prone among us to desire acceptance above all else. Assimilation and being normal insofar as beauty standards are concerned is very much associated with the teenaged experience. So it is worrying in that sense. But anyway, thank you so, so very much for watching. And a special thank you goes to my patrons. Thank you so much for your support, which makes it possible for me to make these videos. Do like, subscribe and leave a comment, particularly if you are thinking of going under the knife, if you have gone under the knife and what it has meant to you or will mean to you. And I wish you all the best on well whatever journey or path you are on and i will see you all very soon in the next one